For this lesson, we'll be focusing on frequency modulation. Now, frequency modulation falls under the subcategory of angle modulation, which also consists of phase modulation. But for this lesson, we'll be mostly focusing on frequency modulation only. Now, frequency modulation is very similar to uh, amplitude modulation, or AM. It is an angle modulation in which an intelligent signal, input signal, is imposed on a high frequency carrier so that its frequency is altered as a function of the intelligent or input amplitude. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, very similar to amplitude modulation, you're going to take your input signal, which is your audio, you're going to add your oscillator, which is going to be your carrier signal, and then your output is going to be your modulated signal. Now, unlike amplitude modulation, this is going to be a frequency modulated, which means your frequency is going to change and adjust based on your input. So let's go over the basic fundamentals. First, the audio frequency range of the human speech is approximately 300 to 3400 Hz. The FM broadcast stations in the range of 88 MHz to 108 MHz band, which comes out to be approximately 200 kHz per station. Also, same as amplitude modulation, the idea to modulate the audio signal with a carrier frequency is to provide a set FM frequency for that transmission. In other words, that's the address for each station. Next, with frequency modulation, you'll also encounter guard bands. Guard bands are used to minimize the interference within the adjacent station. Now, the guard band is 25 kilohertz. It acts as a cushion on the lower and upper edges of each station. It's, again, it's just a cushion or a little bit of leeway. With the guard bands provided for each station, this will allow a remaining 75 plus or minus kilohertz frequency deviation around the carrier. Similar to amplitude modulation, frequency modulation also has sidebands. However, unlike amplitude modulation, which consists of two sidebands, frequency modulation consists of several infinite number of sidebands. However, a majority of them do not contain a significant amount of power. Okay, now that we knocked out some fundamentals, let's start jumping into the meat and potatoes. Let's start going over your textbook terms and equations. So for this slide, I provide you with two equations. They're both frequency modulation waveforms. They're just given in two different ways. One's in radians, one's in hertz. Now, typically we'll deal with hertz. However, some of your textbooks may give it one way and your other PE reference material may give it another way. So be aware, these are both the same thing, two different ways. Also, your input signal may be referred to in different ways as well. It may be known as information signal, intelligence signal, or audio signal. Your frequency, your carrier frequency, may be known as your carrier signal or even resting frequency. So be aware, if I use these terms differently, they mean the same thing. And we'll go over the other terms in later slides. The first term we'll go over is modulation index. It's the measure to the extent in which a carrier is varied by the input. Now, usually you'll see this inside the frequency modulation equation. It's very easily spotted. Also, this is found by the actual deviation, the frequency deviation itself, divided by the input. Now, the other term we'll go over is modulation percent. It's the ratio of the actual frequency deviation to the maximum level frequency deviation. Now, for frequency modulation, it's 75 kilohertz. That's your maximum frequency deviation. So usually this is in a percentage, which is always multiplied by 100. And we'll go over that more in example problems. So here's where the curveball the lesson comes in determining the bandwidth of the FM signal. Now going through the textbooks and PE references, I found three typical methods. There's the Carson rule, which is a equation approximation, the Schwartz graph, which is an approximation graph, and then I found the Bessel function, which is a mathematical technique for determining the exact bandwidth of the FM signal, and it's associated with a table. Now for this lesson, I'll be mostly focusing on the Carson rule, the Schwartz graph is very rare to find and only a few of your textbooks may have it. And the Bessel function, I would like to use that, but it takes up way too much time. And some of my textbooks had different tables uh, compared to the others. So if you look at some of your PE references, it may not have the same tables. So I'd rather use something that's consistent across the board, which will be the Carson rule. Now throughout the lesson, you may have noticed some overlap between AM and FM. However, they both have their pros and cons. FM has a greater power efficiency when it comes to their Class C amplifiers. And a Class C amplifier has a 90% power efficiency compared to the 70% AM linear amplifiers. Now again, I said power efficiency, not power consumption. So keep that in mind. 
Also, FM uses less primitive technology, and it's usually more up-to-date compared to their AM counterparts since it's a lot older. Also, the most important factor about FM is it uses noise suppression. FM, has, FM receivers have noise limiters which reduce amplitude noise. And since amplitude modulation is based off your amplitude, any type of noise you've you received is going to go through the other end, usually typically static. So FM has a better sound quality. Now FM also has cons. It's a shorter area of reception, typically about 70 to 80 miles, whereas amplitude modulation is 100 to 300 miles. So you can be in a more remote area and receive an amplitude modulation signal versus an FM. That's why usually typically FM works better in cities versus AM. Now, according to some textbooks, FM equipment is usually more costly than your AM. However, as times go on and change, that, that may differ. All right, now that we went over the fundamentals of frequency modulation, let's do a practice problem. All right, so based on the frequency modulation signal, as shown here, determine the modulation index, modulation percent, and the bandwidth. First things first, looking at this equation, this actually mimics this guy right here. Since that's the case, we can identify a few things. One, M of F is your modulation index. That's what we talked about in one of our PowerPoints. It's that guy right there. So like we talked about, you can very easily spot it just by looking at the equation, which is that guy right there. So right off the bat, without even doing any math whatsoever, my modulation index is going to be 1.5. Pretty simple. Now we need to find the modulation percent, which is capital M. So let's go ahead and plug this equation over here. So we want the frequency deviation over, now 75 kilohertz is the maximum frequency deviation for frequency modulation. So I just went ahead and gave that to you instead of doing it the uh, tough way. And that's going to be multiplied times 100. Well, now we got to find frequency deviation. Well, there's a few ways to find that. We know M of F, we know our input frequency, because referring to this guy right here, that is going to be our input frequency. However, it's given in radians. We want it in hertz. So that guy right there is going to be our input frequency, but let's get it in hertz. So which means 44 times 10 to the 3 divided by 2 pi. And that will give us our frequency. So plug and chug that in our calculator. It's going to give us 7,003. And that's going to be hertz. So now we have F of A. Now since we have our input frequency, all we can do is manipulate it in our modulation index equation over here to find our frequency deviation. So it's going to look something like this. It's going to be 1.5 equals, and then it's frequency deviation, over our input frequency, F of A, which is 7,003 hertz, which is going to be 7,000 times 1.5. It's going to give us an answer of 10,504.5. That's going to be hertz. So we're going to have a deviation of approximately 10.5K. So that right there is our frequency deviation. Now we can plug and chug it in our modulation percent equation up here. So it's going to be 10,500.5 hertz over, and I'll say 75 kilohertz. It's going to equal, we'll plug and chug that in our calculator, 0.14. And then we got to multiply it times 100. Can't forget that guy right there. It's going to give us an answer of 14%. So our modulation percent is going to be 14%. So far, so good. Let me clean this up, and we can find our last one, which is going to be our bandwidth. Now, bandwidth, we're going to use that Carson rule like we talked about in the PowerPoint, we'll get, just to give us an approximation. So we're going to use our Carson rule, which is our bandwidth. And it's going to be in hertz, and it's going to be an approximation of two times your frequency deviation plus your maximum input frequency. 
Now earlier, we came up with a frequency deviation of 10.5 kilohertz. And we came with our input frequency after dividing that by 2 pi. It was f of a equals 7,003 hertz. So all we have to do now is plug and chug it into our bandwidth equation, which is going to be our bandwidth. It's going to be approximately two times, and that's 10.5 kilohertz plus 7,003 hertz. which is going to be 17.503 kilohertz. And then multiply times two. It's going to have a bandwidth of 35 kilohertz. So this one has a relatively small bandwidth. OK, let's do one more. All right, for this problem it says, based on the FM signal, is the bandwidth going to overlap the guard bands? Now in the lesson, we talked about how every station has guard bands on the upper and lower side of the station. And they consist of 25 kilohertz. And this is here and here. And that leaves approximately 150 kilohertz. So if your bandwidth exceeds 150 kilohertz, you're going to overlap and hit some of these guard bands. OK, so we need to look at this FM signal and determine if that's going to happen. Well, the first thing I need to do is determine my input frequency, and I need to find my frequency deviation. So the first thing I want to try to find is my input frequency. I want to find F of A, and that's going to be that guy right there. However, that's giving him radians. We want to find it in hertz. So same thing as the previous problem. It's going to be 94.25 times 10 to the 3 divided by 2 pi. And that's going to give me an answer of 15 kilohertz. OK. Now I want to find maximum frequency deviation. So I want to find this guy right here. Well, the way I can do that is by looking at our modulation index. Our modulation index right there. It's that guy right there. So now that I have my input frequency and I have my modulation index, I should be able to find my frequency deviation. So it's going to be 4.33 repeating equals frequency deviation over your input frequency, which is going to be 15 kilohertz. And plug in and chug that. It's going to be 65 kilohertz. And that's going to be your frequency deviation. So we have our frequency deviation. We have our input frequency. Now we can find our bandwidth. So using the Carson rule again, we're going to use bandwidth is approximately two times. And it's a frequency deviation, our maximum frequency deviation, which is this guy for now. 65 kilohertz plus maximum input frequency, which is 15 kilohertz. And that's going to be 2 times 80 kilohertz. And 2 times 80 is going to be approximately 160 kilohertz. And that is going to be your bandwidth. So going back to the question, is the bandwidth going to overlap your guard bands? The answer is yes, we do have some overlap on our guard bands, and it's approximately 5 kilohertz on each side. Now, we didn't get too deep in the weeds as far as going to frequency modulation. This is just enough to get your feet wet and familiarized with these equations. Hopefully, you'll be able to do some of your practice problems, and it won't appear as Greek to you. So if you have any questions, please let me know, and I hope you all have a good day.